It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Zan Luthi Shulton, um, Murchison Mallory Endowed Chair in Chemistry at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Welcome. Okay, well, this is uh, really great fun being uh, among all these uh, diverse approaches. Uh, one thing, uh, since we have shortened the uh, uh, introductions, I should say, you know, I, I wear two hats. Uh, one is a co-director of an NSF Center for the Physics of Living Cells. And there my experimental colleagues have really taught me the importance of when we do our simulations, use the experimental data, compare it. So, and I think um, in addition to the information that you can get out of the literature. The other hat I wear is of the co-investigator of an NIH center for macromolecular modeling and bioinformatics. And there's really a place for all sorts of different uh, biological modeling at all the different scales. So what I'm going to talk mostly about today are our hybrid simulations where we're mixing these methods to look at bacterial and eukaryotic cells. And it's truly, I'll try to stress in the few examples I get, how we integrate the experiments, the simulation, and the theory. So one of the stories I'll talk to you about is the work that we're doing with the Greg Venter Institute on the, the minimal cell. Uh, in the right-hand corner there, you're also seeing sort of a depiction from the simulation. It's supposed to be a Petri dish which, uh, with a bunch of E. coli there. And coming in the back is all sorts of experimental data. In this case, it was some lovely uh, cryo-electron tomograms from one of my collaborators at the Max Planck Institute in Munich. Um, so uh, as we undertook our work on the minimal cell, and remember, I'm working with physicists. And they hate E. coli because they go, 4,600 genes. How are we ever going to do that? Well, we're going to wait and let Marcus do it. And um, because one of the problems as we started to look at this gene map is there's a big section, one third of it, that they don't know what it does. And they, somebody asked me at a recent talk I gave in Germany, how come it's through shades? Well, so there's some things that are really unclear. And then there's some things that, yeah, it's a hydrolase, right? Um, and the other coloring has to do with the subsystems of that. But you know what I'm going to talk mostly about are the two major regions today, uh, metabolism and genetic uh, information. If you go over and look at the same gene map for the minimal cell, we haven't done away with the unknown. And we, we have from transposon insertion experiments know that some of them are essential. You don't keep them in, it screws up the morpholo morphology of the cell. But what is interesting, you've dramatically reduced the metabolism and the genetic information processing has stayed uh, the major component there. And that's good because we had worked at least on genetic information processing on E. coli, and we hope to take over as much of that as we can. So again, let me just tell you what sort of approaches we have for the different scales in biology at the University of Illinois. These are all program software tools that have been developed uh, by one of these two centers, which with I'm associated with. So it really does depend on what scale you're looking at. I'm going to work over on this scale. So even though molecular dynamics is fantastic at looking at mechanisms of individual molecules, and through my husband's effort, they even got it up to being able to look at, say, the capsid of HIV, it has a time step of femtoseconds. You're not going to do a real cell cycle. Uh, you can try to coarse grain it and go to the Brownian dynamics. You speed things up, up a bit, but if you really want to look at reactions going on in a cell, you're going to have to really use a more coarse grain approach, and what we pick is reaction diffusion master equation. So we have to start talking about diffusion probabilities, reaction probabilities, and because we want to take the spatial heterogeneity of the cell into account, we're going to subdivide the cell into a bunch of subvolumes. And within each subvolume, we'll assume it's well stirred so we can use these typical stochastic uh, treatments in looking at the reactions. The benefit I get from it is my time steps are going to be microseconds. Now, there's another axis missing here, and that's why you have to go to hybrid methods, is one of concentration. If you look what's going on in the cell, there's some things in nanomolar concentrations, and there are other things that are in millimolar concentration. You don't care about fluctuations in millimolar things, right? So we addressed that in a paper 
that was in I, uh, systems biology. And the interesting thing is when you try to publish something there in that journal, it's mostly applied mathematicians are reading it. So we had to compare how to couple these methods with all sorts of other mathematical algorithms. They almost made us take out the comparison to the experimental data. And we go, uh, guys, this is sort of important, right? And then the other end of the spectrum over here, if you really want to start looking at reaction mechanisms and get at the rates, you might want to introduce a quantum mechanical interface to the molecular dynamics programs. And we did that, and that's available to everybody. So now let me go and just give you a quick a review of what the reaction diffusion master equation is. That's supposed to be our simple model of E. coli. There's an outside, a membrane, a cytoplasm, and a nucleoid region. Of course, each of those regions has particles in it. And then we discretize it. We use our um, a millisecond, uh, excuse me, our microsecond time steps to be solving uh, the motions that they can have there. And those motions are either diffusion between neighboring subvolumes or reactions within a subvolume. So it's important. We have, when we talk about the state of the cell, over here, now that's an equation that describes that chemical master equation, the reactions going on within a subvolume. We have to say, what are the particles there? Is it RNA, protein, solute? What is it? And it would be nice if all we had to look at was that top equation and, and get at the quantities that take you out of that state or take you into that state. Unfortunately, it's not well stirred. It looks like that tomogram in the corner over there, which was from Wolfgang, Wolfgang Baumeister's lab. And you'll see a clock ticking. So we've been able to simulate this for over an hour. And we were challenged then by some work that Sunny Shi had done on the lactose uh, the galactic switch, excuse me, the genetic switch. So you see the ribosomes that we got from Wolfgang. Uh, they're sort of at the poles along the side. Uh, he said the, in this case, the, the DNA was mostly concentrated in the nucleoid region. And then you see a gene going off and on, and it's making a membrane protein that allows more of the sugar uh, analog in, like IPTG. I put this other picture up here to remind people, which is nothing new to any of you, but to the physicists, it's really crowded in the cell. There's a lot of stuff there. And you can finally get a slice. You see some space. But if you want to take the crowding into effect, it's another challenge. So let me give you one complete story uh, that we have on uh, the ribosome biogenesis that you heard Marcus talk about. And the reason we picked this one is, well, I worked for years with Carl Vose. As many of you know, he developed uh, this tree of life and that third domain of life, the Archies. The mineral cell that we're working on is, of course, a bacterial mineral cell. And silly us for a while had even tried to do a molecular dynamics simulation of the assembly of this ribosome. It got published in Nature, Nature Communications, but oh, we gave that up because when I saw Wolfgang's tomogram with 3,000 ribosomes, and we have a slow growing. Uh, e. coli. So our doubling times are going to be 120 minutes. And I always put in a plea for students to quit working with the ones that double at 40 and 50 minutes, because you have to take into account multiple copies of the DNA. And that's r another complication for us. So let's go over to this picture, how we got our kinetic model for that. So again, we asked, you have to work with one of the leaders uh, in that field. In this case, it was Jamie Williamson. He does pulse chase experiments. We knew from early work of Nomura that it's hierarchical, the assembly of this ribosome. They're primary, secondary, and tertiary proteins. He did pulse chase experiments where he put in maybe all the primary proteins that bind directly to the RNA, and then threw in secondary one after the other. From that information, we could come up with rates. We could start with the naked RNA, add in the proteins, and the thickness of those lines indicate how many of the simulations went that way and not the other way. And you, as you can see, the assembly looks like it's going primarily from 5 prime to central to the 3 prime. And at the end of this, you have an intact small subunit. So those rates we put in all to this table. So that was the assembly I talked about. Degradation rates that had been measured. Uh, there's several places in the literature we can get that. Transcription, that's a little tricky. Um, uh, so as I said, some of the rates we had to adjust uh, because we wanted to be sure that this thing made 3,000 ribosomes. Both from the work of Wolfgang and Sunny Shi at Harvard, we knew that for this slow-growing E. coli, it made about 3,000 ribosomes. 
translation, we use a typical rate of about 10 amino acids per second. And thank heavens, Johann Elf had measured the diffusion coefficients for the ribosomes and the subunits. So that's the summary of our solution. I remind people E. coli has nine of these rRNA operons. And what you're seeing is for two hours. And those intermediates I showed you on that assembly map are the yellow things. So they're fluctuating in and out. And you get over the course about 3,000 more ribosomes coming in. So here's a movie that shows our simulations. We're going to zoom into the nucleoid region. You'll see the rRNA operons, a couple of them in red, and the ones for the proteins. And now they make a messenger. And of course, can diffuse. And then eventually, it'll uh, uh, attach uh, to associates with the small subunit. And then it will associate with the large subunit. You get a Nobel Prize when you get the structure of the ribosome. <laughs> And through the top, you read through the messenger. And it's making a few of those ribosomal proteins. And I wish I could accelerate this movie, but I can't. Uh, but you're seeing them come out uh, one after the other. And now we'll start with the assembly part that I showed you before. Oh, come on. We fixed this. Oh, man. I don't know what happened. It was supposed to work. There it is. Now it's starting to assemble. So one protein after the other assembles onto the rRNA, and it starts turning color. And at the end, you'll have the small subunit. And we do a similar thing, uh, assume a similar type of kinetics for the large subunit. We do this for two hours and take a look where the ribosomes are and see if it approximately looks like to uh, Wolfgang's tomogram. Now, if you notice, our cell didn't grow. And we didn't take into account that the DNA doubled there. And I had a colleague at our Physics Frontier Center said, hey, Zan, I, remember, I measure those things. There are a lot of those cells that have two of those operons for any one of those genes. So, and then he showed me the data. And I go, OK, we got to do something. So we put it in to get the effect of DNA replication on the distribution of the mRNA. Remember, these are guys doing super resolution imaging. So they're doing STORM and POM. And I have data galore to look at this thing. If you assume a simple solution to it, uh, write down the chemical master equation and solve it, you see that the distribution of the messengers, its mean, uh, its average, uh, its variance, and the Fano factor depend on the doubling time in the cell, uh, where that gene is on the circular DNA, and its degradation rate of that mRNA. So we could actually solve this thing analytically and also test our solutions. And this is how good we did. The experimentalists are two colleagues over there, Jin Yi Fei and Tae Kip Ha. And the experimental data, we didn't even use theirs. We took it from Rob Phillips at Caltech. And Rob knew, too, you got to account for gene duplication. He did it, and he got the blue curve. And the red curve is ours, and those are the two students who did it. They did it not only for the mRNA, but we went on later into Physics Review E and also looked at uh, the proteins, but mostly only for those involved in constitutive expression. Then there was another experiment that helped us accelerate our simulations. Is Tom Kuhlman went and labeled 14 different places on the, uh, on the genome. And by looking where we went from one copy to two copies of that gene, we could develop a replication model for the DNA, the so-called B, C, and D periods. And what's important, at least for E. coli, it grows for a while before it starts copying the DNA. Then it copies the DNA. You got a second copy now. But the cell takes another while to divide. So we put all that in to those simulations I showed you before. And now the box changes. right? And so we can do ribosome biogenesis in a dividing cell. All right, there's a lot wrong with this and I, simulation. I can tell you about it, uh, but not here. Right? Uh, okay, but we did look at where the ribosomes ended up, where the proteins. We did have it again looking like, whoop, like, uh, Wolfgang's results towards the poles along the side. The intermediates, that was a prediction. And I just heard from the folks at John Hopkins University that they indeed, uh, do indeed see those intermediate partial assemblies in that so-called mid-region of, uh, of the cell. So now let me move quickly to E. coli, I mean, excuse me, to the minimal cell. These are two colleagues who lead the effort at the Greg Venter Institute. Uh, why I'm hoping that my colleagues will work on this is it has so few reactions. There are only 155 genes, or it has 493 total. It's one tenth of E. coli. 155 of them are genes. There's about 300 reactions, 300 metabolites. But the, the ribosome biogenesis part, 
we're going to assume it's primarily like uh, E. coli in what we're doing. All right, so uh, because the metabolism, excuse me, has been reduced so much, you have to bring a lot into the cell. So you have it grown in SP4 medium. We almost have it growing now under defined medium, which really helps. But you have to bring in nucleosides or nucleobases. You have to bring in fatty acids to even get the lipids made. And so here is the almost totally essential, based on the transposon insertion data, metabolism of the minimal cell. And you notice there's a face next to it. So I told each of the physics students, hey, that's not that many equations to learn. Each of you do a subsystem. And we're putting it all together. Uh, the kinetic data is, uh, and thermodynamic data allows us to write down the kinetics. What we totally underestimated is if you screw up the metabolite concentrations, and we tried to use the stuff for, for E. coli initially because the Venter folks hadn't quite finished their metabolomics study, uh, you can get some of those reactions to run in the wrong direction. So getting the metabolite concentrations approximately correct, correct is really important. So one thing that we did put in new to that was we added a section on getting the, the, the DNA A filament because we have colleagues now who can measure that filament formation and in initiating DNA um, uh, replication. But I'll skip over that. That's our goal is to get a complete model. Um, my husband had told me one time, oh, that's not much worse than the HIV capsid. I think we can validate what you do through molecular dynamics simulations. Um, and we'll have other experiments. So that was a law. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, about two years ago. Uh, but colleagues at our NIH center are continuing on the work. So hopefully I can show you not only our results, but also the validation of that in the future. So let me tell you, uh, with our program, it's called Lattice Microbes. Uh, what's very important is use the experimental information. We uh, work with all the experimentalists using Jupyter notebooks. So we can quibble over, is that one dot, two dot? What's the fluorescence level? And I told you mostly about the bottom uh, path. I, in the few remaining minutes I have, let me tell you what we've done with the eukaryotic cells. So again, when it's possible, we try to start with a tomogram. And here you're seeing a slice out of it. You can see the nuclear pore complexes. You can see some of the ER. the uh, the mitochondria and the black dots are the ribosome. There's about 150,000 of them there, and you can build up a whole cell. In our hands, it looked like a yeaster egg. Uh, and, uh, and we can even look at a reaction to check uh, what we're doing. We chose this galacto switch because that really made us go to these uh, hybrid methods. Because over here, the uh, galactose is at 11 millimolar. And as the sugar comes in through this G2 transporter, it can be partially metabolized, through G, that reaction G1, but it does block this transcription factor from coming into the nucleus, which then allows more G2 to be expressed. So I'll just show you very quickly. Uh, this was the purpose of that paper in systems biology, is to check how is the communication time between the two different computational methods. We showed that we could do it, pass information back and forth, and now here's the simulation. So let's look into that eye, into the cell nucleus. The gene for G2 will be off. It'll be red at the moment. Eventually, it'll turn on. When it makes the messenger and it goes out to the nuclear pores, it will react with one of the 150,000 ribosomes that are in E. coli. I only show you yellow, the one that's being translated at the moment. Then the protein then goes to the membrane and gets inserted. And because of the asymmetry of the nucleus, you're going to see more of the transporters uh, located to one side of the cell. So we have colleagues trying to label those so you can see if that asymmetry is actually existent. And over in the upper corner, you can see the growth of the transporters from about 1,000 to 15,000. And the concentration of the uh, galactose inside of the cell go from about 0 to about 6. Uh, just to have you get a feel for what this means, uh, computationally, we could not do what we do without uh, a lot of help from NVIDIA, and they always give us their newest and greatest GPUs. So we can simulate about an hour and a half of yeast in a day uh, using so sort of those eight uh, Titan uh, Xs. And another thing that we did after we could do yeast, we, we thought, could we go a little bigger? 
And so then we had a workshop hands-on where we taught our software. We were lucky to get uh, Winfred Vigreba from the Paul Allen Institute to come and to show their data that they had just produced in the beautiful Nature Methods paper. And I'll end the talk by showing you uh, how the human, cell, human stem cell looks like from the inside out and how we prepare it for our simulations. So of course you start with the nucleolus, the nuclear envelope, the endoplasmic reticulum uh, belt that goes around it, microtubules, plasma membrane, and then we start discretizing it to the lattice. This takes a little bit of time, <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, then we go, remind you that we go back through all of these things, poke a few holes into the nucleus because their resolution didn't give it, but we know from work that we have on the HeLa cell what the density of the nuclear pores should be. And now you're ready to start looking at a differentiation pathway. So we started one, but uh, it really, uh, those are difficult simulations because to get that cell also to form into whether it be a neuron or a cardiac myocyte, you really have to know not only what genes get turned on, but which ones do you have to suppress. And of course, all of this is only possible because I have outstanding students and collaborators. So those are the folks from the uh, Greg Venter Institute. Those are some of the programmers from our NIH Center. And then my colleagues from our Physics Frontier Center at Champaign-Urbana. And then a really set of gifted students and graduate students. Many of them have gone on, like Marion, who led the work on the minimal cell. He's now a professor at uh, in the Netherlands. So thank you very much. Excellent. We are able to take a number of questions. Just raise your this hand. This is where there's always it. stunned silence. <laughs> <laughs> is, is this real? <laughs> Any questions? Oh, of course. <laughs> Marcus. Well. Stunned silence and appreciation for sure, but I. Um, but I have to say, it's your fault because you <laughs> told us it was possible. <laughs> you know, we just wanted to make a full kinetic model. Well, I uh, thank you. <laughs> the uh, I think one thing that is really interesting to me is I wonder how hard it was to get the the diffusion data you, that you needed. Was that a because it does? I mean, it seems like that would be in tough many to cases. Find the right like uh, for the because we felt too, as you say, the ribosome is a very important key player in these things. So uh, Johan Elf is one of the leading uh, spectroscopists. Um, I knew he was coming out with the data, so we used that. Otherwise, you can just try to use hydrodynamic models. Turns out, like uh, one of our colleagues at the Physics Frontier Center, Ido Golding, mm -hmm. had measured diffusion for the mRNA. Um, we had, uh, if you use hydrodynamic uh, data, hydrodynamic radii, for the proteins, it's not that big of a problem. Right, so that was available, right? Yeah. And as I said, and even going towards the minimal cell, uh, there were estimates on what some of those reaction kinetics should be, but we decided to go back to ground one, uh, or ground zero actually, and then look at, uh, try to use thermodynamic data uh, to develop it, get the rate constants, did it agree what was in the literature? And your comment about Brenda was well taken. I, I took that uh, plot out to show all the range of kinetic data they had. And then when we, and as you know, even when you run these flux balance analysis, you often put, is that reaction reversible or not? And with the kinetic data, we could see, yes, there's a big separation. That reaction should look irre irreversible into right. people doing flux balance. So we had a lot of checks going on. We could just, you know, I can't bring that all in yeah. in a talk. No, I love it. Thank you. Uh, I, I, this was very, very impressive, and I think, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm part of the neuroscience modeling part after lunch, but uh, it's, it's clear, I mean, in, in the cell modeling community, mm -hmm. you obviously have some excellent successes, it seems, that you're really able to, uh, to model sort of like interesting processes. But I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, I mean, most people in your community are not modelers or physicists, I would assume. So how, how is this kind of activity received by the experimental, I would assume, majority in this field? 
Well, as I said, I'm really f fortunate because we have one of the Physics Frontier Centers. There are a finite number of them, there's like about 10, and only a few are dedicated to biological physics. So we are very lucky. I, two thirds of my colleagues are experimentalists. So, you know, they're more like, well, can you show this, Zan? Or, you know, and so that's helpful. And I would also say, if you win a few battles, even the biologists at my place, you know, they're more interested in, can you simulate that or can you put that in? I have found the hardest thing that I've addressed is to be able to incorporate the data. And I think you got a flavor for that from Marcus's talk. Well, so they'll work on E. coli, right? But two different strains. One will have it in rich medium. One will have it in medium, uh, you know, uh, minimal medium. How do you combine that information? So even to get Sonny Shi and Wolfgang Baumeister to give me data, you know, I had to really, mm, can you sort of work on the same system? And, um, and I loved it that they got a count of 3,000 using two totally different methods. One was cryo-electron tomography, and one was labeling ribosomal proteins. So you can do it, but it takes a lot of coercing, you know, not coercing, uh, let's say uh, cajoling, 